In 1979, Japan faced a crisis on Amamiyoshima Island. Residents were living in fear of Protobothrops flaboviridis, the habu, a venomous pit viper native to the region. These snakes were not just dangerous, they were deadly. In 1980 alone, roughly 400 people were bitten, and some of those bites proved fatal. The island's lush forests concealed these fast-striking serpents, and for many locals, a walk through the woods could turn into a life-threatening situation. Medical treatment was available, but there was a catch. The anti-venom required refrigeration to stay effective. Unfortunately, many of the snake bite cases occurred in rural parts of the island, where electricity was unreliable or unavailable altogether. Delivering refrigerated medicine across mountainous terrain and remote villages wasn't just hard, it was nearly impossible. As victims suffered and fatalities rose, officials knew they had to act fast. Rather than investing millions in new infrastructure or attempting to develop a heat-stable anti-venom, the government turned to a simpler, more natural solution, biological control. If they couldn't stop the snakes with medicine, perhaps they could introduce a predator to control the population. They needed something agile, aggressive, and naturally resistant to venom. They believed they had found the perfect answer, the small Asian mongoose. These animals had a legendary reputation. In India and other parts of South Asia, mongooses had long been known for killing venomous snakes, including cobras. Their quick reflexes, thick coats, and partial resistance to venom made them formidable opponents. The mongoose was not only fearless, but built for speed. Its movements were often compared to those of a professional boxer, dodging, weaving, and striking with precision. Most importantly, the mongoose had evolved specialized receptors that helped neutralize snake venom, allowing it to survive bites that would kill most animals. So in 1979, Japanese officials brought 30 mongooses to Amamiyoshima Island. They believed the animals would swiftly reduce the snake population and, as a bonus, help with the island's growing rat problem. The plan seemed flawless. Nature versus nature, predator versus predator. What could go wrong? At first, locals were hopeful. The mongooses were seen as heroes, fearless little warriors sent to liberate the island from its venomous plague. But the optimism didn't last long. Months went by, then years. Yet the habu snakes were still there, plentiful as ever. Meanwhile, something else was happening. The mongoose population was booming. Here's what went wrong. Mongooses are diurnal, active during the day. Habu snakes, on the other hand, are nocturnal. They sleep during the day and hunt at night. So while the snakes were hiding in their dens, the mongooses were out exploring. And when night fell and the snakes emerged, the mongooses were asleep. Despite living on the same island, the two species rarely cross paths. Even if their schedules had matched, snakes are difficult prey. They're dangerous, elusive, and capable of defending themselves. A mongoose could certainly kill a snake, but only with considerable effort and risk. So the mongooses did what any intelligent predator would do. They took the easier path. Amami Oshima was teeming with vulnerable animals, rabbits, birds, mice, lizards, and eggs, none of which posed any threat. Why battle a venomous snake when a defenseless rabbit was just as filling? The mongooses quickly adapted, not to the snakes, but to the buffet of easy prey all around them. By 1993, the consequences were undeniable. From the original 30 mongooses, the population had exploded to around 10,000. The snake problem remained unsolved, and a new problem had taken its place. An invasive predator was running wild, and the worst was yet to come. Amami Oshima isn't just a remote island. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and a biodiversity hotspot. Its forests are home to countless rare and endemic species, many of which evolved in complete isolation without any natural predators. These animals had no defenses, and they were being wiped out. The Amami rabbit, often called a living fossil, became the primary victim. This rabbit species once roamed across Asia, but today it survives only on Amami Oshima and one nearby island. It had outlasted ice ages and volcanic eruptions, but it couldn't outlast the mongooses, with no instinct to hide or fight back, the rabbits became easy targets. Their population began to crash. Another victim was the Amami spiny rat, a rodent species found nowhere else in the world. Just like the rabbits, these rats had never faced a predator like the mongoose. They were defenseless, and they were disappearing fast, and it didn't stop with mammals. Mongooses also raided nests and devoured bird eggs. Some bird species lost entire generations. Others couldn't find enough mates or habitat to survive. 
In just two decades, the habitat of many animals had shrunk by up to 40%. The once vibrant island forest was growing quieter. Entire food chains were collapsing. The mongooses were supposed to be snake hunters. Instead, they were becoming ecosystem destroyers. By the early 2000s, the situation had spiraled into a full-blown ecological crisis. The original snake problem now paled in comparison to the damage being caused by the mongooses. The Japanese government was forced to confront the reality. Their solution had failed, and now they had to fix the mess. In 2000, the Ministry of Environment launched an aggressive eradication program. It began with simple traps along roads and trails, but mongooses were clever enough to avoid them. The population was too large and too dispersed for basic efforts to work, so they escalated. The government deployed specialized traps, toxic baits, and scent lures. Motion sensor cameras tracked mongoose movement. Search dogs trained to sniff out mongooses joined the operation. But all of this cost money, and a lot of it. Then came the breakthrough, community involvement. In 2005, a group called the Amami Mongoose Busters was formed. Despite the humorous name, this team was dead serious. Made up of locals and wildlife professionals, they knew the island better than anyone and were deeply motivated to save it. Together, they placed 30,000 traps across the island, hiking into remote, dangerous areas to monitor them daily. It was hard, dangerous work, but it began to pay off. Over the next few years, the mongoose numbers began to fall. Slowly, the native wildlife began to return. Amami rabbits were seen again in areas they had vanished from. Birds began to breed successfully. The island's ecosystem was beginning to heal, but it wasn't over. Complete eradication was the only way to ensure the problem didn't return. The team continued year after year. Every captured mongoose was one step closer to victory. By 2015, sightings had become extremely rare. Camera traps stopped picking up movement, and search dogs couldn't detect mongoose scent. The end was near. In April 2018, the last mongoose was captured. After that, nothing. For years, the island remained mongoose-free. In 2024, after exhaustive monitoring and data review, the Japanese government officially declared the project a success. Amami Oshima was mongoose-free. It was a historic achievement. According to global records, only nine successful mongoose eradications had ever been recorded. And this was the largest island to accomplish it. Over 32,000 mongooses had been captured. That's more than 1,000 times the number originally introduced. The cost? Millions of dollars, years of effort, and thousands of hours in the field. But the cost of inaction would have been far greater. The loss of an entire ecosystem, and with it, some of the rarest species on Earth. Amami's recovery has become a model for the world. Today, the techniques used on the island, combining tech, traps, trained dogs, and community volunteers, are being replicated across other Japanese islands and countries battling invasive mongoose populations. But the story carries a powerful warning. In the end, the original snake problem solved itself. Not because of mongooses, but because of better human practices. People learned to wear protective gear, anti-venom became more widely distributed, and public awareness campaigns reduced risky encounters. By 2020, habu bites had dropped to just 60 per year. No deaths had been recorded since 1992. The mongooses? They didn't reduce the snake population at all. They simply created a bigger crisis that took 25 years to undo. This story reminds us that introducing a new species to fix a problem is often a dangerous gamble. Nature is complex, and small changes can have massive, irreversible consequences. The lesson from Amami Oshima is simple. When trying to solve one problem, don't create a bigger one. Sometimes the real solution isn't in nature, but in how we manage and adapt to it. Here's a surprising fact to chew on. China now controls roughly 50 to 70% of the world's squid catch. In concrete terms, that's well over a million metric tons of squid per year, enough to fill thousands of rail cars. Think of the calamari rings on your dinner plate. A huge portion likely started in one of these distant Chinese trawlers. With so many squid ending up on tables from Beijing to Boston, one question matters. How do they catch so many squid? Let's set sail into the world of China's squid boats and discover the secrets of their catch. China's squid harvest relies on a chain of huge investments, advanced planning, and onboard know-how. Here are the key pieces of that chain. A massive, government-backed fleet, China has deliberately built the world's largest distant water fishing armada. In fact, Chinese distant water fisheries catch over 5 billion pounds of seafood a year, 
and the biggest portion of it is squid. To get there, the government has poured billions in subsidies into bigger ships and cheaper fuel. The result? Enormous steel trawlers that can stay at sea for months. These vessels are so large that they scoop up as many fish in a week as a local boat might catch in a year. By comparison, the U.S. distant water fleet has fewer than 300 vessels. With thousands of boats cruising the high seas, China's squid fleet simply overshadows every other squid fishery on the planet. Satellite and data-guided hunting. China doesn't send its ships blind. The government and fishing companies use satellite data, oceanographic research, and even military-grade logistics to track squid migrations. Researchers have reported that the Chinese state feeds its fleets real-time updates on major squid hotspots. For example, in 2022, about 260 Chinese ships were seen jigging together in one part of the Pacific. When one spot was fished out, the entire armada raised anchor and repositioned 100 miles away in unison. This kind of coordinated hunt, essentially tracking clouds of squid across the ocean, is unprecedented. It's been noted that fishing vessels from most other countries wouldn't work together on this scale. In short, China's fleets act like a well-informed squad of hunters. They scout, communicate, and swarm where the squid are thickest. Eerie nighttime light shows. Once near the squid, Chinese boats switch on the real magic. Bright lamps to lure squid up from the depths. Squid are attracted to light, so fishermen rig their vessels with hundreds of bulbs that blaze green or white. In fact, Chinese lighting vessels can carry up to 700 incandescent lamps, enough light to rival a football stadium. From shore, this creates an otherworldly glow on the horizon. A 2021 report described how fishermen on Taiwan's Matsu Islands watched a complete line of green lights in the distance. This isn't just for show. By encircling an area in light, the squid, just like moths to a flame, concentrate under the lamps. Nets and jigging lines. Lured by the lights, the squid are then scooped up. China uses two main methods, pair trawling and jigging. In pair trawling, two ships run in parallel with a huge net stretched between them. As they plow through the water, any squid and other sea creatures in between get swept into the net. According to a multinational study, nearly 800 pair trawler operations were observed in one season of North Korean waters alone, all traced back to Chinese fleets. This method is extremely efficient and also very indiscriminate, catching bycatch non-squid species along with the squid. The second method, jigging, uses thousands of hand lines. Each squid jigging boat is fitted with rows of glowing lures on long poles. Fishermen crank in lines of colorful hooks, each hooked with bait. When enough squid gather, the crew hauls up thousands at once. One captain said his crew could catch as much as 400 pounds of squid a night during peak season. That's roughly a ton per night for a single boat. Both methods, massive nets and dazzling jigging, allow Chinese fleets to pull hundreds of tons of squid out of the water in a single expedition. Onboard processing frenzy. The work doesn't stop when the squid are on deck. Every squid must be processed fast. Crews meticulously weigh, measure, clean, and freeze the catch right on the ship. Deck hands gut squid, remove beaks, wash the bodies and pack them into trays or bags for freezing. Reports from the high seas describe crews weighing, measuring, washing, sorting, eviscerating or packing the squid into metal trays for freezing and bagging. In short, Chinese squid ships are floating factories. They catch and immediately process huge quantities of squid to preserve freshness, allowing them to stay out at sea for months. Many vessels even have medical bays or run as flying hospitals for the crew. Industry pressures and controversies. Why go to all this trouble? Partly because the economics and politics push it. China's government treats distant water squid fishing as a national strategic priority, subsidizing technology and port facilities. Local governments in China compete to build squid processing plants lured by economic benefits. The recent growth is staggering. China's squid catch has exploded from just 30,000 tons in 1998 to nearly 1.1 million tons in 2022. All this is driven by rising demand at home and abroad, but this level of harvest raises alarms. Pear trawling, in particular, is criticized for killing millions of non-target fish. There are even reports of some Chinese ships ignoring territorial lines. 
The very lights near Taiwan were labeled encroachment by local officials. And behind the scenes, NGOs have uncovered dark fleets of Chinese boats fishing illegally. For example, in sanctioned North Korean waters, grabbing an estimated $500 million in squid since 2017. Labor watchdogs also document horrific conditions for crews, long hours, beatings, and dangerous work. All of these pressures, ecological, political, are tangled up with how the squid are harvested. Just when you think you've heard it all, China is now testing AI-driven lighting systems to optimize squid attraction. Yes, there's even a government R&D project where squid boats use sensors and artificial intelligence to fine-tune their lamps. In essence, China's squid harvest hinges on combining old-school fishing with cutting-edge coordination. It uses flashy technology like laser bright lights and satellites and raw muscle, big steel boats and countless nets in a way no other country currently does. The next time the sky looks unworldly green, remember, it might not be aliens. It could be hundreds of hungry squid boats chasing the world's favorite cephalopod. China's squid story shows how big it can get when politics, technology, and nature collide on the high seas. Keep asking questions like, how did this get here? And you'll uncover more of the hidden gears behind our everyday world.